You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings and welcome to the show Words on Film, which is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and I've got a great show for you, or rather, I've got five movies to review for you for this show. I hope it's a great show, but I, you know, I always come in here and do my best. But first, I'm going to get into my usual segment, What's Topping the Box Office? The top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. They may not necessarily be winners, but they are definitely in the top 10. So starting my list off is the movie that was number one last week, and I'm not surprised it's number one this week, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Now, a lot of people have been saying mainly good things about this movie. I've heard a bunch of people say that it's not as good as the first one. I disagree with that, but they still like it, so that's sort of the takeaway here. But anyway, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is... Actually, excuse me, it grossed $65.3 million this past weekend, which is a bit of a drop from last week, but last week was opening week. But so far, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, on a budget of $200 million, has, in the United States, grossed $248.4 million. Around the world, it has grossed $431.5 million. I knew it would be a hit somehow. In the United States, it, it is a tentative hit so far. Around the world, it is most certainly a certified hit. And it probably will be a certified hit in maybe two weeks. But we'll see. Snatched is the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week. And it's the number two movie at the box office this weekend. Having made $19.5 million on a budget. Oh, got the wrong slip. Hang on. All right. On a budget of just $42 million. Around the world has made $22.6 million, so it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but has a very good chance of being so maybe by next week, maybe two weeks from now. King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, number three at the box office this weekend, number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, having made $15.4 million this weekend. However, it, it is worth it to note that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 made $65.3 million, which is more than Snatched and King Arthur combined. That's kind of interesting. But it made, King Arthur made $15.4 million on a budget of $175 million. That's not a very good start for this movie. In addition to that, they have also made $45 million around the world. So it has a very, very long way to go to recoup its budget, and it's not looking promising so far. The Fate of the Furious, in its fifth week in release, is number four at the box office this weekend, sliding from number two last week. This weekend it made $5.4 million, which doesn't seem like much, but when you consider that its budget is $250 million, it has so far made... $215.1 million in the United States. Around the world, it has made a staggering $1.9 billion. So here in the United States, it's technically not a hit, but around the world, it is most certainly certified, and that probably goes without saying. Beauty and the Beast, another billion-dollar maker around the world, is number five at the box office this weekend, which was exactly the same position it was last week. This weekend, it made $4.8 million. Against a budget of $160 million, Beauty and the Beast has made $494.1 million here in the United States, and around the world, it has made $1.21 billion. It is interesting to note that The Fate of the Furious has made just slightly less than Beauty and the Beast in five weeks in release, as opposed to Beauty and the Beast that has been out for nine weeks. I don't know how to explain that trend, but regardless, Beauty and the Beast is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and it has nothing about which to be ashamed. The Boss Baby is number six at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week. The Boss Baby made $4.5 million at the box office this weekend. Against a budget of $125 million, The Boss ma Baby has made $162.3 million here in the United States and $456.9 million around the world, which makes it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. 
How to Be a Latin Lover is number seven at the box office this weekend, having made $3.9 million, which is actually nearly 40% of its budget. On a budget of just $10 million, How to Be a Latin Lover has so far made $26.3 million here in the United States, and around the world it has made $41.4 million so far. So it's not pulling in nearly the numbers that Beauty and the Beast, The Fate of the Furious, or Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 have, has done so far, but it has made twice its budget back, more than twice its budget here in the States, and more than four times its budget around the world, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. The number three highest grossing debut movie of the week is also the number eight movie at the box office this weekend. And this is one I missed. It's one called Low Riders. And I did briefly describe what the movie was about last week in my segment, What's Coming Up Next. But unfortunately, I didn't see it at a theater near me. So, but apparently a lot of people did. So anyway, Low Riders made $2.4 million at the box office this weekend. But that is against a budget, I kid you not, of $916,000. A lot of the times in the top 10, a lot of these movies are in the millions in terms of budget, but man, it's very rare that I see one that's below a million dollars, but this low, low, low budget film made more than twice its money back, making it a certified hit here in the States, and I don't have the international numbers for you. The Circle is number nine at the box office this weekend, falling from number six last week. And this is a movie that's struggling a lot. This weekend it made $1.8 million. Against a budget of $18 million, it has so far in the United States made $18.9 million, and around the world has made $23.7 million. So it fortunately made all its money back in just three weeks. But it is not the hit that studios probably expected it to be, especially with high-profile names like Emma Watson and Tom Hanks. But as I said last week, Emma Watson is in another movie, Beauty and the Beast, that has literally made more than a billion dollars around the world. So her career probably is going to hurt because of this. Bahubali 2, the conclusion, is number 10 at the box office this weekend, having made, in the United States, $1.6 million. Against a budget of $39 million American dollars, Bahubali 2 has so far in the United States alone made $19 million. Around the world has made $230 million. Quite impressive. Hi, I'm Layla Ali. I might be undefeated in professional boxing, but there's one problem I can't fight alone. Childhood hunger. 17 million kids in America struggle with it. That's why the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks gathers surplus food and gets it to hungry kids. Join me in supporting Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. To help solve hunger in your community and to find your local food bank, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the first film I'm going to be reviewing for you is... King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. This is the newest film from Guy Ritchie, and I believe this is the first movie about King Arthur since a movie of the same name that came out in 2004 that starred Kira Knightley. Well, this one is another attempt at bringing King Arthur to the big screen, and sometimes King Arthur, the story of King Arthur has been brought to the screen with success, such as the 1995 movie First Night, starring Sean Connery. There's also Excalibur from 1981, that stars Helen Mirren. And of course, there is the Walt Disney animated classic, The Sword and the Stone, which I actually think is prime for a live action remake, probably even more than the other live action remakes that are in development right now, such as Aladdin and the Lion King. But getting back to the movie at hand, so this film, as I said, is directed by Guy Ritchie, and it stars Charlie Hunnam, who you might remember from 
such shows as Sons of Anarchy and such recent movies as The Lost City of Z. And The Lost City of Z wasn't a great movie, but Charlie Hunnam was really good in it. The other people who star in this movie include Jude Law, Eric Bana, and Jaiman Hunso, amongst other people. So this is, for all intents and purposes, an origin story. That's why it's called Legend of the Sword, because part of the story has to do with Excalibur. That is, King Arthur pulling the, sto the sword called Excalibur out of a stone, and because he is able to do so, he is the true king. That's not spoiling anything, I promise you. So, robbed of his birthright, Arthur comes up the hard way in the back alleys of the city, specifically a brothel, but more on that later. But once he pulls the sword from the stone, he is forced to acknowledge his true legacy, whether he likes it or not. So, this movie has some pretty good special effects. It definitely has some good use of CGI, and for a budget of $175 million, it better, right? The problem here is the story, and I don't so much have a problem with origin stories. A lot of people have been saying, especially with the comic book movies that are coming out, that the origin story is overdone. I don't think that's true. I think that an origin story needs to be established in order to know where a character is going. However, with King Arthur, I feel like unlike most of the superheroes out there, either from Marvel or DC, a lot of people these days, especially younger millennials, don't really know the significance of King Arthur. And the thing is that King Arthur, very much like Robin Hood, is not based on a specific book. He's based on English folklore. He may or may not have existed. His name probably wasn't Arthur, but the point is that ever since the Middle Ages, the story of King Arthur has been passed down from generation to generation. So there's no actual basis in terms of literature. Of course, books have been written about King Arthur, but every single one of them has had a different take on King Arthur, very similar to the movies. So I do feel like an origin story might have been appropriate for a later film, and maybe the, the legend of King Arthur could have been better utilized for rather... Having King Arthur be the king and having the Knights of the Round Table be the center of the story probably would have been a better move. But that's not the big weakness of King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. The big weakness is that, yes, you get a viable backstory for King Arthur, but you also get a ripoff of Hamlet, and maybe even probably more a ripoff of The Lion King, in the sense that you do find that King Arthur was born into royalty, but King Arthur's father's jealous brother killed him in spite in order to obtain the crown. And in the very beginning of the film, you find that the Excalibur sword in the stone is discovered, and many people try in vain to pull it out before this guy named Arthur, who, leaving the kingdom, is brought up in a brothel, and just for the hell of it, takes two hands and pulls the sword out of the stone. You would think that would mean that he's the true king, but unfortunately, the king in this movie, who's played by Jude Law, the evil king, Vortigern, has other ideas. So, the movie starts out actually pretty well with the, the king Uther, who's played by Eric Bana, who is the father of Arthur, in, in a war with a species, or rather another kinds of humans, called ma the mage. And the mage is basically wizards, people who, who practice magic and witchcraft. And initially I thought to myself, okay, that, that's an interesting way to introduce the story of Arthur, but, and also maybe even to introduce Merlin as an enemy of the Kingdom of England rather than an adversary as he later becomes. I'm all for that. But not only does Merlin not appear in this movie at all, he's, he is mentioned, but he's not, he doesn't appear. But also, after Vortigern, Jude Law's character, obtains the throne, the whole idea of the mages being at war with the non-magic-practicing humans, <laughs> I'm just going to call them the humans for short, because I can't repeat that. But anyway, that war is just dropped. 
And, you, and it leads you to, to think, why were the mage at war with the humans? It seemed like Uther, Eric Bana's character, and Arthur's father was a good king, so why would the mage be at war with him and not his evil brother who obtains the throne um, deceptively? So that's one of the problems. Also, I think Guy Pierce got so focused on this being an action movie that if you actually watch the action sequences, you'll find that they jump cut at at least every five seconds. And five seconds is usually a long shot. So eventually you see one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And the, the scenes cut very rapidly, so much so that you don't get invested in the story, and you also don't really get invested in the characters either. So King Arthur Legend of the Sword is a good-looking movie, but unfortunately, Guy Ritchie does not do for King Arthur what he did for Sherlock Holmes. And for that reason, King Arthur gets my rating of a strikeout. Again... There could have been room for a really good origin story, but I think you'd really have to establish why King Arthur is important first. You're struggling with your mortgage. You think about it all the time. What are we going to do if we lose the house? It's time to stop thinking and start dialing. Call 1-888-995-HOPE for a free government program that offers expert one-on-one -on -one advice about your mortgage options. We've helped over a million homeowners and we want to help you. Call 1-888-995-HOPE or visit makinghomeaffordable.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Treasury, HUD, and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Are you, sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I'm... I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run a oh, that's right. radio we, show. Right, we have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the oh, crap. crap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. Uh-huh. And we're trying to bring you f straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's, our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. facts. No. The show is called... Backed up. up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m., and it's an hour long. Yeah, only on BFR. <clears throat> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to... Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access TV, or SCAT V for short, or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page, to which I'm pointing right now, or Boston Free Radio's page. Either way you could join me, thank you for joining me. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Snatched. This is the latest movie starring Amy Schumer and a woman who hasn't been in a movie in quite some time, certainly not in a starring or even co-starring role, Goldie Hawn. And the two of them play mother and daughter. And this movie is directed by Jonathan Levine. And Jonathan Levine it has directed a number of comedies as of late, including The Night Before, uh, which I didn't think was a great movie, but it had its merits. And he has also directed Warm Bodies, which was a movie he did in 2013, kind of a send-up of the zombie genre, a little bit of a love story there. So naturally, Jonathan Levine has directed some interesting films. In terms of being interesting, Snatched is that. In terms of being good, eh, it needed a little improvement. I wasn't sure whether to hate this movie or like this movie going in. I try to go into every movie with what they call an open funnel. In other words, with no expectations. But Amy Schumer, even though she's very popular right now with some people, is experiencing a bit of a backlash with other people. So anyway, just getting into what the movie's about before I get into the politics of Amy Schumer. When her boyfriend dumps her before their exotic vacation, a young woman persuades her ultra-cautious mother to travel with her to paradise with unexpected results. And unexpected is a bit of an understatement. So, this young woman is named Emily uh, Middleton, and she's played by Amy Schumer, as, as I said before. And she actually had a not very glamorous job at a retail store before ultimately getting fired for talking back to her boss. 
And then, as these comedies usually go, you find her at a restaurant bitching and whining about it with her boyfriend, Michael, played by Randall Park. And you can tell from Randall Park's face that he's about to break up with her, but Amy Schumer's character, I guess, is so self-absorbed that he do- she doesn't see that this is where their relationship is going. But anyway, out of a job and distraught and also having two non-refundable tickets to Ecuador, Amy, um, Emily goes home to her mother, Linda, who's played by Goldie Hawn, and spends a few days with her and ultimately convinces her mother, Linda, to go with her on this Ecuadorian vacation. And Linda is very, very cautious. In fact, there's one scene, probably one of the only scenes I chuckled at when I was watching this film, where Goldie Hawn calls her on-screen daughter and tells her that there was a shooting in Delaware, and even though I know you're living in New York, I just wanted to make sure you were safe. That has so many echoes of my parents, I can't even begin to tell you. But that was probably one of the only scenes where I laughed. And I could tell that Amy Schumer was trying, and certainly Goldie Hawn was as well, but... Once the story gets going, not only is the conflict, the quote-unquote unexpected results that happen incredibly contrived, and the way they resolve themselves seems to be highly unrealistic, but what's more was that the movie wasn't exactly all that funny. I mean, Amy Schumer did tone down the vagina jokes, but then again, the name of the movie is Snatched. And not to get too X-rated here, but there is a name for a vagina, and it's in the title of this movie. That's all I'm going to say about it. And of course, that, there's that double entendre there, which didn't seem particularly appropriate, but given Amy Schumer's brand of humor, you, you can connect the dots pretty easily. But what really didn't make this movie work was that Amy Schumer and Goldie Hawn had no chemistry together. You would think that they're both funny women... They're both blondes, albeit not exactly ditzy blondes, even though Amy Schumer does have somewhat of a valley girl voice or a valley girl way of speaking. But either way, these are both smart and funny women, but they couldn't really connect. And the ironic part is that Goldie Hawn's partner, Kurt Russell, connected so much better with Chris Pratt in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 than she does here with Amy Schumer. And I'm not sure whose fault it was, but I I even thought as I saw advertisements for this movie, why didn't Goldie Hawn do a movie like this with her actual daughter, Kate Hudson? I think it's surprising they never have done a movie together before. That I know of, certainly not in any starring role, but I just didn't think that the two of them worked well together. And again, this movie wasn't terrible. And as I said before, Amy Schumer is experiencing a lot of backlash, particularly because her humor is more inclined towards women than guys. And a lot of guys, myself included, don't really find her vagina jokes all that funny. And I I can certainly say that for myself. I don't hate Amy Schumer. I think she is funny. And certainly, I will say this, A lot of people on the internet refer to her as stand-up comedy's flavor of the month and think that a couple of years from now, she'll be seen as a punchline the same way other flavor of the month comedians of years past, like Dane Cook or Tom Green, are seen now. I don't know about that. I will say that Amy Schumer's movie Trainwreck was funnier than anything Dane Cook or Tom Green has been in. I, that, that's a given. Yes, it was predictable, but I just, I, I thought Trainwreck was a good showcase for Amy Schumer. Here, the, the plot in, in general, not only the conflict was contrived and unrealistic, but I could tell where the movie was going. I could tell that, I couldn't exactly tell how the plot points would resolve themselves, how the conflict would resolve itself, but I knew it eventually would. Also, there are supporting performances here by a lesbian couple, Ruth and Barb, who are played by Wanda Sykes and Joan Cusack. And they're okay, although I could, 
I can only stand the sound of Wanda Sykes' voice for so long. But Snatch gets my rating of a strikeout, not because I hate Amy Schumer, but because I've seen her do much better and I know she can do better. People are always looking to invest in a good opportunity. So what if you could invest in the future of kids, like a stock? Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change called Better Futures. With your investment, it helps students like me go to college. My name is Charles, and I'm your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org slash invest. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. Brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council. What scares you? What really scares you? <laughs> My name is Sam Baltrusis. I'm the author of seven historical-based ghost books, including 13 Most Haunted in Massachusetts and Ghost to Salem Haunts of the Witch City. During the day, I'm an author and journalist. At night, I moonlight as a paranormal researcher and write about the things that go bump in the night. I dig deep for the skeletal secrets buried beneath New England's blood-stained soil. I uncover secrets, dark secrets, tales of murder, mayhem, and madness that happened over a 300-year period. For the next hour, we'll take a haunted train ride to the allegedly haunted locations featured in my books. From Ghosts to Boston, Haunts of the Hub, to 13 Most Haunted Crime Scenes Beyond Boston. This is the 13 Most Haunted Radio Show. Welcome to my nightmare. <laughs> Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Gifted. This is the latest starring Chris Evans, as well as a number of other people, including newcomer McKenna Grace, who is a young cutie. And it also stars Lindsay Duncan, Jenna Slate, and Octavia Spencer. For those of you who are thinking that Chris Evans is not going to be back to play Captain America, don't worry, he will be. This is kind of the movie that he did in between Captain America Civil War, Spider-Man Homecoming, in which he will make a cameo, or maybe even a strong supporting performance. And of course, a movie that's filming right now, Avengers Infinity War, which is coming out next summer, the summer of 2018. But anyway, Gifted is a small indie film about a man named Frank, who is a single man raising his child prodigy niece, Mary. And he is drawn into a custody battle with his own mother, the child's grandmother. So this young girl, Mary, who's played by uh, Mary Adler, who's played by McKenna Grace, who, as I said, is somewhat of a newcomer. She did make an appearance in How to Be a Latin Lover, but basically this is, I think, her first major starring role. But she is a seven-year-old girl who is a math genius, very much like her deceased mother. And her deceased mother, who was as I said, also a math genius, committed suicide, which leads her brother Frank, played by Chris Evans, to raise her niece in Florida. However, once Mary Adler's exceptional mathematical skills that go far beyond her first grade classroom, much to the surprise of her first grade teacher, Bonnie, played by Jenny Slate, eventually Frank Adler's mother, who's also Mary Adler's grandmother, Evelyn, played by Lindsay Duncan, comes in to try to assume custody of, of Mary, claiming that her being put in a public school undermines her actual intelligence. Whereas Chris Evans' character, who again is named Frank, wants Mary to experience life as a normal child go to Girl Scouts, just have friends, in spite of her intelligence. So there are good arguments to be made both ways in this movie. And I think the movie addresses a certain problem with child geniuses very well. Of course, when I was a kid, I'd, I'd watch stories on 2020 about nine-year-olds graduating high school. <laughs> I would be so envious, which gives you an idea of how I felt about school. But I remember thinking to myself, man, it would be great to be a genius, you know, to go through grade school, high school quicker than my peers. But 
it's kind of lonely at the top as well, especially when you see footage of some of these nine or 10 year olds marching in their high school graduation along with their much taller um, <laughs> classmates. Yeah, you kind of have to think to yourself, that's probably kind of lonely. So, but at the same time, is a public school education right for kids like these? It's, it's a really good question. And the movie brings up some excellent points, especially when you find out that Mary's mother was a mathematical genius. Yes, but she also killed herself. And that's really, that's, that's really unfortunate. And eventually, a number of, a, a number of things in Frank Adler's and his sister's past come to light in regards to how their mother Evelyn raised them. In fact, there are some pretty compelling court scenes in this film. And overall, it's a, it's a good little film that amazingly Chris Evans did on his break between Marvel films. And I, I got to respect him for not exactly taking a risk by doing one of these movies, but still working in between films that probably have incredibly hectic schedules both in production and in post-production to say the least i mean chris evans is one of the biggest movie stars on the planet right now solely because of captain america so he could have just focused on being captain america but it, it's good that he's doing little films like this and the chemistry he has between with jenny slate in this film and initially, there's a bit of a conflict between the two, but of course, because they are both attractive young people, a relationship is formed. Um, the, the chemistry between them is, I guess, unquestionable. And it turns out that the two of them were actually dating in real life. In fact, both of them stopped by the, Coolidge, um, the Brookline Booksmith in Coolidge Corner at one point uh, for a for a book signing of one of Jenny Slate's books about some mollusk. I, I don't know exactly, but it did happen. But anyway, getting back to the, the movie, this movie is very reminiscent of the film Little Man Tate in terms of theme and also in terms of what exactly to do with a child genius besides lock him up in a dark room, figuratively speaking, and have them do math problems or you know what they're good at or how much exposure to the outside world is good for them and where do you find the balance between having a child who is special in the best sense of the word but not have her be alienated and it, it raises some really good questions again i'm sure little man tate had the same kinds of themes but i do have to confess that i have not actually seen Little Man Tate. I just know the movie by basic plot and by reputation. But I'm sure some of the same things were visited here. But all the acting in this movie is great, especially McKenna Grace, who I couldn't help but think bore a striking resemblance to the actress Kiernan Shipka, who plays uh, Don Draper's, or who played Don Draper's daughter on Mad Men and who's been in some other movies too and if I hadn't known that that Ms. Shipka is actually in her teens now I would have thought she was this girl but besides doppelgangers Gifted is a very thought-provoking film it never gets boring it certainly tugs at your heartstrings in a number of instances and it gets my rating of a knockout it's certainly a film that makes you think it certainly makes you feel a certain way for the main characters and it's overall a really good film to watch how's it going i'm having a stroke are you gonna shake my hand i'm having a stroke wow you're not even moving your arm i'm having a stroke when someone is having a stroke they may not be able to say it with words but their body language will tell you loud and clear look for fast f face drooping a arm weakness S. Speech difficulty. T. Time to call 911 immediately. Know the sudden signs. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. You're listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Snacks and treats, brother. Snacks and treats. Snacks and treats. My name is Matt Rocha. Hashtag. Hashtag. Snacks and treats. <laughs> Snacks and treats, man. Get behind it. 
it, man. You get behind it? I think it sounds good, especially when you say it. I think and treats. I want some snacks and treats. Snacks and treats. Thursday at 9 o'clock on BossonFreeRadio.com. <laughs> Two chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Should have just been one. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to review is a quasi-new one. It actually was released last year, December of 2016, and was considered for several nominations. However, it only was nominated for one Golden Globe. Um, I, I think I mentioned the movie already, Miss Sloan. Miss Sloan is the latest starring Jessica Chastain. It also stars such noteworthy actors as Mark Strong, Gugu Mbatha-Raw, and John Lithgow. So this movie takes place in the high-stakes world of political power brokers, and it focuses on Elizabeth Sloan, who is a lobbyist played by Jessica Chastain, and she is the most sought-after and formidable lobbyist in Washington, D.C. But when taking on the most powerful opponent of her career, that is the gun lobbyists, she finds winning may come at too high a price. So this is a movie where there is a lot going on. This is a movie that is very much in the vein of Aaron Sorkin. And as I was watching it, I was actually thinking, Aaron Sorkin must have written the script. But as it turns out, it's a script written by Jonathan Pereira, who has literally never written another script before, or at least not one that's been made into a movie. This is his very first one. And it is an incredibly intelligent and razor sharp script. It's directed by John Madden, who's directed such movies as Shakespeare in Love, the two Best Exotic Marigolds Hotel movies, and a a number of other films. He's been nominated for one Oscar. I don't think he actually won. He was nominated for Best Director for Shakespeare in Love, but he didn't win. I think he might have lost that award to Steven Spielberg, who actually, in truth, should have won for Best Picture for Saving Private Ryan that same year, but he didn't, and that's another story. And interestingly enough, Steven Spielberg actually wanted to direct this movie. This movie had been in development hell for a while and was actually considered one of the best scripts not made into a movie or not made, not being in pre-production for a movie. So it had been kind of been tossed around. It's kind of understandable to see how this movie didn't exactly find an audience or would would struggle to find an audience. But it is very smart. There is a lot going on and there and at 2 hours and 15 minutes there are parts near the 1 hour 30 minute mark that drag a little bit, but the ending is incredibly explosive. It, it's it's one of those endings that took a while to get there, but ultimately it's an ending that comes when Jessica Chastain's character, Elizabeth Sloan, is testifying before the Senate in term for allegedly performing illegal activities while being a lobbyist for the anti-gun campaign. In other words, expansion of the Brady Bill. And if there's one thing to take away from Ms. Sloan, it's a couple of things. First of all, there are not only a lot of powerful people in Washington, D.C., but our, our administration, our current administration excluded, a lot of very, very smart people. However, there's also, you can kind of see from watching this film how people in other areas of the country besides Washington, D.C., on both the right and the left, are frustrated at Washington, D.C. for not getting anything done. Because people especially power brokers in Washington, D.C., have their own agenda, and they will push to fight for that agenda, even if their agenda is not right. For the character of Elizabeth Sloan, she is fortunately pushing for something that is right, that is gun legislation that requires people to have background checks before purchasing a gun. And... This is something that is still hotly contested in Washington today. And it would seem, as you're watching this film, that this is a true story. 
Turns out it isn't. It's actually fictional. There's nobody who exists now or who has ever existed who is a lobbyist named Elizabeth Sloan. And all the events in this film are more or less fictitious. Probably inspired by actual events and real lobbyists who are working for and against anti-gun campaigns. But rest assured, this movie is so razor sharp and so intuitive of the Washington, D.C. mindset that it feels like a true story. It doesn't exactly feel like a documentary based on how it's shot, but it certainly feels like there is some basis of truth in this film. And I, I don't know very much about the screenwriter, Jonathan Pereira, but I would think that this guy probably got his start in Washington, D.C., or at least has a law degree to back up the excellent dialogue and the amazing characterization that's in this film. And what's more is that Jessica Chastain herself shines in this movie. I think she is the best actress working today who has never received an Oscar. She should have received one for Zero Dark Thirty back in 2012, but th that's another story. Here, she owns this film. Not only is she incredibly powerful and not to mention a formidable lobbyist in this film, but she also has an interesting extracurricular life. She's not married. She doesn't have a family or children or anything like that. But, well, to get a certain release that is, and she doesn't even have time to date, let alone sleep. But <laughs> there is a subplot here that is actually quite intriguing where she regularly and unapologetically, albeit not in public, meets with male escorts, or particularly one male escort in this movie who's another good um, supporting actor in this movie. And I can't find his name right now, but he's been in a number of other films, but I'll, I'll just move on. But there are a number of very strong supporting roles in this movie, especially by John Lithgow, who plays Congressman Ron Sperling, who is grilling Jessica Chastain about her allegedly illegal activities. There's Sam Waterston, who plays George DuPont, who is a lobbyist for the, the NRA and other gun control um, lobbying companies. And there's also a great performance here by Gugu Mbatha Raw as one of Elizabeth Sloan's allies in this fight for gun control. And it's a movie that, yes, it drags a little bit, but I was amazed at how smart this movie is. It gets my rating of a knockout. It's certainly one of the most overlooked movies of last year. Keyboard Cat, Hamilton the Pug, and Toast Meets World. These are some of the internet's most beloved pets. And they all have one thing in common. Their stories started in a shelter. Start your story. Adopt a dog or cat today. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Training that pet to play the keyboard, that's optional. Start a story. Adopt a shelter or rescue pet today. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. I love those real sick sons. They're the ones that move. A thinly blown neurotic toe Intensify and groove me All this and more on Unpopular Music Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a documentary called Chasing Train, or its full name, Chasing Train, the John Coltrane Documentary. It's a film that explores the global power and impact of the music of John Coltrane and reveals the passions, experiences, and forces that shaped his life and revolutionary sounds. So if you are a John Coltrane fan, you are going to love this movie. If you're a jazz fan, you, you will either love or very strongly appreciate this film. If you're not a jazz fan, you might have a greater appreciation of jazz music while watching this film. 
It's written and directed by John Scheinfeld. And John Scheinfeld, whose last name, by the way, is spelled S-C-H-E-I-N-F-E-L-D, is no, is no stranger to uh, music documentaries. He actually directed one music docu- documentary I saw years ago, long before I had the show, that I really liked, which was called The U.S. versus John Lennon. And it was a movie that described or very much detailed John Lennon's fight with the U.S. government in terms of his opposition to the Vietnam War and how the CIA and senators like Strom Thurmond fought back, almost threatening to, actually threatening to repeal John Lennon's visa in the United States. It's a fascinating documentary and one you should watch. Another one is, another one he wrote and directed is Who is Harry Nielsen, which is about the singer of the same name. So this, I believe, is John Scheinfeld's first foray into jazz, and it is a very highly detailed documentary that makes a lot of good use of John Coltrane's music, as it should, as well as some a very impressive amount of stock footage and pictures from John Coltrane's life. The number of people and the actual people who were interviewed for this documentary is vast and amazing. Now, you would expect a movie, a documentary about John Coltrane to feature some members of his family. And as far as I know, the, the movie had all of his kids, or at least all of his living children, in the film, as well as one of his wives. He was married twice. And it also had a number of jazz musicians who are living today who worked with him, such as Sonny Rollins. It had a number of high-profile jazz artists from today, such as Wynton Marsalis. And it also had a number of other people who I wouldn't have expected to be in this film, such as former President Bill Clinton, who actually had a, a lot to say about John Coltrane's music. And initially you think to yourself, well, why would Bill Clinton be in a movie like this? But you got to remember, A, Bill Clinton is very in tune to African-American culture, and B, remember he played the saxophone. So he had to have been an ad- admirer of John Coltrane's music, but it is pretty amazing how John Scheinfeld got Bill Clinton to be in this film. What's even more amazing is that the, the segments of this film, which are from the perspective of John Coltrane, either from his, his works that were published or actually from his own personal diaries, are narrated in this movie by none other than Denzel Washington. This is a very good choice for the voice of John Coltrane. In fact, this documentary reminded me a lot of the recent Oscar-nominated film, I Am Not Your Negro, which was a documentary film not directed by John Scheinfeld, but directed by Raoul Peck. And it's based on James Baldwin's unfinished manuscript, and James Baldwin's words were read in the film by Samuel L. Jackson. So, yeah, if they, did, if they couldn't get Denzel Washington, they probably could have gotten a high-profile black actor like Samuel L. Jackson or somebody. But Denzel Washington, very much like Samuel L. Jackson in I Am Not Your Negro, narrates this film and makes you think less, wow, that's Denzel Washington, and more, wow, that's John Coltrane. And Denzel Washington's voice is so distinctive that... Initially, when you hear his voice narrating anything, you know it's Denzel Washington. But eventually, without Denzel Washington having to adjust his voice, from what I know, he really, from his cadence and his flow, got the essence of John Coltrane down better than probably 95% of any African-American actors could. And I definitely commend... Denzel Washington for reading John Coltrane so well. And there's a lot here that if you didn't, if you only know the basics of John Coltrane, maybe a couple of his songs, like his jazz version of My Favorite Things from The Sound of Music, um, uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein, then there is some information here that will probably surprise you like for instance 
I consider myself a jazz fan or at least a jazz appreciator, maybe not an aficionado, but I definitely appreciate jazz and I like a lot of it. But I had no idea. And music majors all over the country will probably throw their instruments at me for not knowing this. I did not know that John Coltrane played the saxophone for Miles Davis on the album So Blue. But sure enough, he did. And certainly, along with the other session musicians on that album, contributed greatly to not only that album being one of the best music albums of all time, but also cementing Miles Davis' legacy as not only the King of Cool, but also one of the best jazz trumpeters ever. So there are a number of great interviews. Certainly, there are people who were associated professionally with John Coltrane's music. But the other people who are fans, such as, as I said, Bill Clinton, but also Carlos Santana, rapper Common, John Densmore, who you might know as the drummer for the band The Doors, had a lot of interesting and insightful things to say about John Coltrane. So with documentaries... I have said before, a documentary should either tell the story or not. This film tells the story of John Coltrane so well. Very lightly touches upon his death, which was because of liver cancer. But his life was so much more fascinating than his death. Chasing Train gets that, and it gets my rating of a knockout. Even if you don't like jazz, you'll love this movie. When I grow up, I want to be a new pair of blue jeans. When I grow up... I want to be a kid's first computer. I want to be a place on a cool I want to day. Be a I want to be a bike that races around the country. I want to be a bench on a forest trail. When I grow up, I don't want to be a piece of garbage. And if you recycle me, I won't be. Give your garbage another life. Recycle. Learn how at IWantToBeRecycled.org. Brought to you by Keep America Beautiful and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I'm glad you could join me. So I just reviewed my five movies, and now I'm going to go into my next segment, which is what's coming up next. These are the films that you will probably see this weekend, and I can't exactly give you a recommendation right now on how these movies are going to be, because frankly, I don't know. And I... Every movie is good until proven bad, as far as I'm concerned. Innocent until proven guilty. That's a mantra I try to live with my entire movie-going existence. Some critics go into movies and declare the movies guilty until proven innocent. I don't like to do that. They're innocent until proven guilty for, for me, and that seemed to serve very well for me. But anyway, what's coming up next? The biggest movie to come out this weekend is unquestionably Alien Covenant, which is the fifth Alien movie, if perhaps you don't count Alien vs. Predator or Prometheus. Prometheus, from a couple of years ago, I think it was 2014 it came out, disappointed a lot of people. Alien Covenant certainly has the potential to disappoint a lot of people. However, not only does it pass... Not only does it boast an impressive cast by the likes of Michael Fassbender, Catherine Waterston, Billy Crudup, and Danny McBride, interestingly enough, but it's also directed by Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott, as you might remember, directed the original Alien film. And some people say that Aliens, the sequel directed by James Cameron, was better than Alien. I wouldn't go that far, but Aliens was certainly a formidable sequel. But Alien Covenant, I'm not sure how it's going to be, but here's the, here's the plot of the movie. The crew of a colony ship bound for a remote planet discover an uncharted paradise with a threat beyond their imagination and must attempt a harrowing escape. So I don't know if this movie is a prequel to Alien or if it's a sequel, 
Or it's one of those things where the, the aliens attacked Sigourney Weaver a bunch of times in the last four movies, and th- this is where the movie goes. But in any event, I'm going to see this film. I've seen Alien and Aliens. I have not seen Alien 3, and I have not seen Alien Covenant. But I've seen enough of the Alien films to kind of bend my my sequel rule. That is, for me to see a movie, I have to have seen the... For me to see a sequel, I have to have seen the original movies. So Alien Covenant, in this case, counts, because I've seen the first two films. I hear they're the best. I know enough about the other two Alien films, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection, to know that they kind of sucked. So... Alien Covenant, I'm going to see it. I'll let you know what I think. Another movie that's coming out is another sequel, or shall we say a franchise reboot. This one is Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul. So the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series produced, the the book series produced three movies, and all of them starred the same cast of people. But now that the kid in the movie is no longer a wimpy kid, and the last movie he made was in 2012, yeah, they need to start the franchise over if they're going to make this film credible. So anyway, not only is the wimpy kid in this film getting replaced, but basically the whole main cast is getting replaced. So the parents in this film, rather than being played by Steve Zahn and Rachel Harris, are this time played by Tom Everett Scott and Alicia Silverstone. So this Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie brings us back to the Heffley family who are on a road trip to attend Meemaw's 90th birthday party. But the road trip goes hilariously off course thanks to Greg, the Wimpy Kid's newest scheme to get to a video gaming convention. So I've been actually pleasantly surprised by the Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies. I liked the first one. I didn't see the second one. The third one had good, clean humor and it made a guy with as sick a sense of humor as I have laugh. So the the two out of the three films I saw were pretty good. So I'm not sure how this movie's going to be. I'll let you know, but judging from the other movies, it certainly has a very tough act to follow. But I'll let you know when or if I see it. Another movie that's coming out is one called Everything, Everything. This is a movie about a teenager who's lived a sheltered life because she's allergic to everything, but she falls for the boy who moves in next door. So this is a movie about an interracial romance, but I'm not sure if it being an interracial romance is central to the plot of the movie. Either way, I'm kind of intrigued by this notion, although it does look like one of those teen romance dramas. Either way, it doesn't have anybody who is particularly famous. Probably the most famous person in this movie is Anika Noni Rose, who has had supporting roles in movies like Dreamgirls and was also the voice of Princess Tiana in The Princess and the Frog. But if I get to see that movie, I'll let you know what I think. But that concludes Words on Film for this week.